welcome to the Investor Coaching Show. Here's your host, Paul Winkler. And welcome. <laughs> it's the Investor Coaching Show. Evan. Evan Barner here with me. <laughs> Already cracking me up. There what on go. earth are you doing, man? Burning my do, keep. Don't do that to me. <laughs> Burning my keep, brother. <laughs> Boy, is it hot enough for you? <laughs> Man, I, I, I'll tell you what. I was out mowing at about 7.30 this morning, almost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's warm. Yeah, I, I, I was, you know. I was cutting, too, this morning. <laughs> I, I felt, I felt, that's I feel what, your that's pain. some of my best thinking time, right? It's probably oh, me years too, on, me the, too. on the mower. It's me just too. so cool. Like your doing. head starts to wonder. But uh, I was also moving some stones. Uh, my lovely bride wants me to basically take a part where she was planting garlic mm -hmm. and now i'm using these you know 100 pound stones to build a fire pit <laughs> that's like 150 yards away <laughs> oh my goodness and i was hauling these things oh, thinking my goodness. you know how did the egyptians build the pyramids i mean it was just like this is hard work just moving this you know stone they, they had a couple with more, a they had a couple and more sons i think <laughs> yeah so yeah it's, it's father's day tomorrow so maybe uh, maybe you should exactly maybe you should have had a few more I'll, I'll be in a wheelchair for father's day <laughs> i think you are all right so uh so much oh my goodness so much because i was off at a financial conference this week and and there's so much to talk about uh in and out of the news and just things from the conference itself uh, super stuff out there. So I am sure that we will get to a lot of things. One thing that uh, that caught my attention, there was several. There were several things, Evan, that were. You see, I, I, I told you so. <laughs> and you know, so just that temptation to go. I told you. I told you to you know to keep to pay attention to this. Right. There were several of those this week, and uh, you know, I thought I would. Pay you know, give a little bit of this out there. And then, you know, a couple of questions that came in as well. Uh, so one, one thing that really hit me was in market watch. I don't know if you saw this, but it was, I love this because so often what people think, you know, we talk about, let me build this up. We talk about here, get away for 23 years, get away from stock picking. Right. Don't look at track record. You know, three, five, I know you got something on track record there, which I, I, I can't wait to get to because I have no idea what that article is about. I, yeah. But I thought it would be really interesting to hear when your track record isn't even right uh, or the track record doesn't even, you know, isn't even accurate. Right. Uh, but, you know, so um, the, the whole idea that you typically hear is look at five and 10 year track record in choosing funds, which is, just mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense because markets go up and they go down. What follows up, down. And you're buying after something has done well, and but it sells mutual funds, and that's just hey, what can we do? What can we get? How can we get people to pull the trigger and do what they, what we want them to do? And there's something about that too that I, that I'm going to get to today. Another I told you so uh, type of thing that I'll get to, but uh, I'll save that. So the idea being that don't try to figure out which company is going to do better than other. You know, don't ask me which, hey, what do you think about XYZ stock? Hey, Paul, what do you think about right. this? You know, hey, and, and we'll even tell people don't stock pick. And then five minutes later, they go, well, what do you think about this stock? Exactly. <laughs> Have you ever had that happen, Evan? Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I have it happen all the time. I, and it makes me crazy. It, it does, and I think the other thing, and this one doesn't make me crazy. I think it's more of a function. You've probably studied this on the psychology side of a client that owns a stock mm -hmm. views holding that stock differently as stock picking, at least in their own mind. I think a mm. lot of people mm -hmm. picture stock picking as yeah. when I buy the stock, right? but that entire journey as the investor is stock picking as long as <laughs> well, you sure. hold it. You're stuck. Yeah, picking. yeah. Well, and you, and you think about it because it actually uh, it lines up with another rule of investing, right? You know, buy and hang on to it's, stuff. Yes, and you know, yeah. well, if I'm buying and I'm hanging on to something that isn't prudent, which is an individual stock, because you have all kinds of non systematic risk, mm -hmm. and you have risk in the system. For those of you who don't know what on earth that means, which is the system. Think of it as the ocean. The, the ocean is a system that goes up and down with the tide, and 
the boats that are on it will go up in tandem with the ocean. You know, the currents come up, the boats go up, and they all go up. Not just one goes up, they all go up. And if they don't all go up, that means one's sinking. Um, so, you know, what happens is when the ocean comes up, that's the system raising the boats. Now, if all of a sudden we're looking at a single boat and that boat sinks, that is non-systematic risk. That is not the, the system so much as the, maybe the boat got a hole in it. Right. And that's why it went down. So that's a different deal right there. Now, that's the thing that we get is, you know, we get into the rules of investing. We often talk about that. So typically, what do people say is the answer to, well, don't stock pick, don't market time. What type of investment should we get into? And that would be an index fund. Right. You know, so you look at that and go, okay, so in, yeah, just buy index. Well, this uh, article says index funds are ruining the stock market. Well, What's the be title? Interesting. Yeah, this is this is good. good. Passive investing is making market concentration. Work. And this is a, again, this is we told you so. Moment. It's making concentration worse. Says new research that we talked about twenty years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we talked about that this is the problem with indexing. I've said it for years. I've said it in all my books. And it says index funds are great in this article. But it's, it's, I, I, it's so much better when you can borrow somebody else's credibility. They give you the broad exposure to the entire stock market, maximum diversification, and minimal costs. And that's, what, that's why they sell, is because people, just like in the diet industry, they said, get rid of fat. <laughs> we, you know, get rid of fat and you will be skinnier. Now I eat three boxes of snack wells instead of one chocolate chip cookie. Right. And then, of <laughs> course, you get lots of sugar, which makes you... Fat, right? I mean, that's the problem. It's it, you know the message. It sounds great, you know. Right. Get rid of all your expenses. You know, just have minimal costs. But here's the problem. And it says everyone should have their money in index funds, right? That's the thinking these days, and it has a lot going for it. Low cost index fund, and you know, and I agree with that. You know, the low cost is a good thing, but you can't myopically only look at the management fee because, you know, as we often talk about. You have expenses in a lot of different areas that you don't even know about. Right. You know, you have, what are they doing with securities lending revenue? What are they doing with block trading? What are they doing, you know, as far as momentum? Are they doing anything with that to reduce expenses? You know, what are they doing with reconstitution effect, which is, it's a hidden expense. And, you know, go, if I don't, if you don't know what any of those things are, well, you know, that's it. It's too complicated. You can't understand this. Yeah. Is what the in- investment industry tries to lead you to believe. Uh, but if index funds are great for any individual, what happens when everybody buys them? Does everybody win? And that's touched on new research written by finance professors Huao Zhang. I probably totally butchered that. <laughs> Michigan, Michigan State University. And Dimitri. Vianos, maybe I got that a little bit better. Doesn't sound like either one of them live in Nashville, so you're okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, just forgive me on that one. They argue that the popularity of index funds is helping cause one of Wall Street's most dangerous features: the massive overconcentration of the S and P 500 and the market into a few mega cap stocks like Apple. Numbers regarding index funds are amazing. They said, says uh, since in 1993, they write. Passive funds, like an index fund would be a passive fund, invested in U.S. stocks managed $23 billion of assets. That was 3.7% of combined assets managed by active and passive funds. And 0.44% of the U.S. stock market. So it's tiny, tiny. Very small percentage of money that was actually managed in this particular manner. By 2021... The passive assets had risen to 8.4 trillion from 23 billion. That was 53 percent of combined active and passive, and 16 percent of the stock market, which is you know not the whole. I mean, not the whole market, obviously, but that's that's a pretty big jump. Now, from 3.7 percent of money, uh, mutual fund money, to 53 percent, though, that's the point here. Are in they in 30 years? Are they including target date funds in their definition of passive, or are they only talking about index funds? I would assume that they are because they're looking at underlying funds, and a lot of the target date funds are funds of funds. Yeah. So they're going to look at the underlying funds when they're doing the research. 
I could imagine. I, I would imagine because well, that just seems like a big number, even for growth. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. A, it is a big deal. Actually, the real change is probably even greater, though they think, because uh-huh. they're looking at closet indexers. You know, it's, it's <laughs> like you know when you looked at Magellan Fund, right? When it became a closet index fund, or yeah, because they were so afraid of selling stock that it would trigger taxes, so they didn't want to even sell stock. So Magellan. Which was always known for active management. Mm-hmm. Management, you know, Peter Lynch ran that one, and they became a closet indexer. So they think it's even higher than that. Well, yeah, one of the one of the fund families that we see a lot, uh huh, that's in a lot of four hundred one k plans as well as uh, a lot of at least one particular brokerage firm, uh huh, sells a lot of these funds. It starts with an A. Yes. And it's American fund. Just wasn't, okay, this wasn't <laughs> no, you can't. Go ahead. Group, yeah, it's fine. You know. Yeah, you're right. You know, you look at what those funds own, mm-hmm. and they're, and typically someone will have five or six of those. And right. of course, we look at the MRI of the portfolio, and they all own the same stuff. And all of those, to me, are closet sure. index funds, I, I would agree even though with that. they're actively managed. No, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. know, they, they they tout active management, right. but if you look at it, there, there are periods of times when they're outperforming a little bit and then underperforming right. the next period of time, and you go, well, okay, so it's going, and you think about that, if it's overperforming, if a fund is overperforming the market at some times when the market's going up, let's say, mm-hmm. and underperforming when the market's going down, now you got increased standard deviation. Right. you got increased risk, which can be a huge problem that people don't even think about. People, you know, you're, you go, you need to make sure you consider risk in the investing process. Great. How do you measure it? <laughs> yeah. Nobody asked that question. Exactly. You know, they need to ask that question. But here's where the real risk of the index funds is coming from, as they point out in this study. You know, and, then they, and this is something we mentioned many times here on the show. They said in the article, it says at this point, the so-called Magnificent Six, uh, you know, it went from Magnificent Seven, didn't it? Down to six. And then, you know, what was uh, the great, I forgot what was the other one. It was something four. I lost track after it was Fang and then it went to something else. And Oh, yeah, it's all over the place. <laughs> Tesla seems to have vanished from the list alone to account for one third of the entire S&P 500 by assets, one third of it, the magnificent six. Wow! And that is something that we've talked about here. It's just you look at that and you go, you can't have that much concentration in just a few companies and not think that you're asking for trouble when those companies turn a corner and yeah. they're selling for super high prices. Right. Yeah. Now, what do they recommend in here in in the article, or one of the things that they bring up? is, you know, it's not an argument for selling the S&P 500 index fund. And I agree with that. It's not, you know, oh, go and sell everything out now. You know, don't own anything in that particular area of the market. But divide it up and, you know, make sure that you're capturing other market segments. Now, they're talking about some small cap indexes, but small cap indexes have the problem that you're overweighting big companies. So you're still getting bad concentration in areas of the market you don't want. Um but they're talking about, yeah, well, you could do an equal weight index fund of the S&P 500. And that is a problem. Because what an equal weight index fund, it sounds good from a marketing standpoint, but what you're doing is taking 500 companies and having an equal amount of money in all 500 versus just way the heck overweighting those big companies. But the problem is, is this. Think about it. If you have one day that a particular company is one five hundredth of it, and then it's going to be a little bit less than one five hundredth of it because it does poor, does poorly performance wise, and another company that is done really well is taking up more than one five hundredth of the index, then you've got to sell stock in one and you've got to buy stock in the other, and now you've got all kinds of transaction costs and taxes. So you, if it's a taxable portfolio, you can have transaction cost trading. And, you know, so it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do it that way. But that's just it. That's what Wall Street does. Is if they figure out that there's a problem with one manage, one way of managing money, they just go to a different problem. Well, yeah. <laughs> They're just really good at that. <laughs> I was, uh, I think this was a business book I was looking at recently. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, I think it was from Dan Kennedy. An old oh, yeah. uh, Dan Kennedy book. Yeah. The and, strategic you know, coach. kind of thinking about Wall Street. Yeah. Um, that's Dan Sullivan. Oh, that's Dan Sullivan. Um, Dan Kennedy. Now, no, no, wait uh, a minute. Who's Dan Kennedy? He's a then? copywriter, marketing guy, okay. uh, direct response for small businesses. I got the and Dan so right. 
proactive. A lot of okay. infomercials he created okay. way back in the day. Oh, okay. So I'm not familiar with him. Um, okay. But he was talking about Disney uh-huh. and Wal- what when you're talking about Wall Street solves the problem with creating another problem. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It, and fees is where this is going. Mm-hmm. You know, Disney had a problem of people complaining about long lines. Uh huh. So they charged for a program that says, okay, we'll put you in the fast line. Disney monetizes their problems. Uh huh. You know, if it's raining, they'll sell oh, that's Disney such umbrellas. A good point. That's such you know, a good point. Yeah. Well, Wall Street kind of has the same philosophy. Oh, that's such a good and that's such and a good When you were talking about point, the, yeah. the uh, cap, not cap weighted, but the equal weighted, equal weighted. index, uh-huh. mm-hmm. people listening to that may mm-hmm. think, well, what do I care? That's going on inside the fund. I'm not paying a commission. Right. But you are, the fund is not trading for free. And, most people, you know, when we educate people, it's like, oh, I didn't know that was in addition to the management fee. So if all that yeah. trading is going on, it's coming out of your pocket. I'm it glad you made that point. It's coming out of the fund company's pocket. Yeah, I'm glad you made that point because, yeah, that isn't necessarily clear to people that there yeah. is an expense and you are paying that expense. Yeah. And, and then you're still missing out exposure in areas of the market that are really, really important. You know, it's right. it's just it's product. It's a product related, you know, way of doing things, and product related ways of doing things are typically not a great way of approaching <laughs> fixing your financial problems. Okay. But anyway, so I just thought that was interesting. Something we've been talking about for quite a while, you know, because people ask. Well, I mean, and, and I've heard financial people that try to you know dismiss what we teach here. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're just indexers. That's all they're doing. They're just index fund. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. You know, no, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. Uh, but you know, the indexing idea is valid, and a lot of times we will use it in a four hundred one k because you don't typically have necessarily the choices we want. So yeah. you know, and it is a better alternative. Uh, it, you just miss a lot of asset categories with it because a lot of areas of the market aren't indexed at all. You don't have funds that actually do it because there's no demand for them. But also the issue is the way they're managed. But it can be a real, real big problem if you're looking at target date funds, as Evan was talking about, because a lot of the target date funds are using total market index funds, and they are super, super overweighting this big area of the market. And you know, as much as I possibly can, it's kind of like when I first started this show – Back in the early 2000s, I made the point about a lot of things that you shouldn't be doing. I couldn't get people to actually change and not do them until yeah. after they had lost all the all this money. Yeah, you know, it was yeah. it was like with the 2001, 2002 market downturns. Then all of a sudden, oh yeah, maybe we ought to listen to this. No, listen to it before it happens. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Uh, and and you know the other thing that's interesting is that they they talk about in here. There was there was an article that was talking about where money is flowing. Investors have never, speaking of dumb things that people are doing, right? they've never withdrawn from S&P 500 funds like they did last week. This is Market Watch. Investors withdrew from S&P 500 ETFs, exchange traded funds, by the largest amount on record, according to Lipper. Now, Lipper does a lot of investment research, investment industry research. S&P 500 index funds saw the largest outflows, according to data, from Lipper's global fund flows. In the week ending June 12th, S&P 500 exchange-traded funds saw outflows of $17 billion, even as the index advanced by 1.25%. Right. <laughs> but i got to pull out before it goes up. <laughs> It seems like investors were backing growth funds. Oh, isn't that great? So, so, so that you know. Okay, so S and P five hundred, roughly five hundred biggest companies in the U.S. Okay, so when you're looking at the five hundred biggest companies, as we just mentioned, it's just hugely overweighted with some big growth companies, as we talked about. You know, as we you know, six six companies making up you know like a third of it. That's just crazy sauce. There's just a lot of money in just a few big companies, right? Which is dangerous. Well, are they becoming prudent and pulling out because they don't like that a concentration? No, they're becoming even more concentrated. Right. They're buying S&P 500 exchange traded growth indexes. The growth ETF, IVW is where they're putting their money. Well, why would they be doing that, Evan? I mean, what would be the reason to go and take your money out of the S&P 500 and put it in the growth <laughs> Can you think of I'll, any? I'll take performance chasing for 500, Alex. 
<laughs> I'll change my name to Alex. But uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's they're, it. That's they're, exactly what they're, they're doing. They're overweighting the six stocks that were beating the other 494, <laughs> piling all in while they're doing a, yeah. pe- a peak. Well, we don't know it's a peak. I shouldn't say that. While they're at a new high. Yeah, at a new high. They're uh-huh. adding more. Yeah, yeah. And this is exactly what's going on. S&P year-to-date performance was about 14%. And the, but the S&P growth index, which they're piling into, 24%, almost 25%. You know, so literally, they're going, wait a minute. 25% is better than 14%. I think that's where I want my money. I want my money in something that has a higher return. Well, that's past performance. You can't look at that and go, that's going to be continuing into the future. And then there's some people that are just plain market timing because they right. yanked it out of money market. Yeah, right? They yanked well, it out of money market, out of stock funds and put it in money market funds. Right. And, well, and I think it's significant in that story mm-hmm. that they're addressing ETFs and not funds. Oh, good point. You know, because really good point. Yes. in theory, you know, if if you decide, you know, you're in a 401k and index funds the only choice I have and, you know, okay, you you've got to play the hand you're dealt. Mm-hmm. ETFs, exchange traded funds that are mimicking the index which should be a buy and hold strategy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They can trade these things more frequently and likely do. Right. It you know, they're they're misusing yeah. why they invested in an index in the first place. Right. The whole idea behind the index fund is stock picking and market timing are, are foolish. Don't do it. It doesn't, you know, you, you can get lucky and beat the market, but you've got to attribute that to luck. Right. And then what they're doing is engaging in literally what the fund or the ETF was designed to avoid. You know, so they're literally just falling back in the same trap without even recognizing it. And it was, you know, John Bogle actually hated the idea of the ETF for that very reason, interestingly. The company who was the founder of the company, Vanguard, that actually is one of the biggest traders of that stuff these days. You know, and he hated the whole idea of it. And they're now they're the biggest. So it just kind of it, it goes to show how the industry just typically just does not say stay terribly disciplined. And they're not great at keeping people disciplined. You know, it's like, are you going to change a problem? Are you going to get rid of a problem that you profit from keeping people in is really what it gets down to. And the answer is usually no. That's unfortunately the case.